There are a couple publications you need to be familiar with when you decide to navigate. They include the sectional chart, terminal area chart, and the chart supplement. And we'll cover all of these in this video. Obviously you want to use current publications, which means don't use anything in this video because it could be months or years after the fact. For all the symbol charts and markings, there's the Aeronautical Chart User's Guide. It's a great read, especially if you're looking for a really good nap. But in all seriousness, if you're not sure what a symbol means, this is a great place to look it up. Now the US is split up into a bunch of sections. It's a big country after all. Each one of these charted sections is called a sectional, go figure. And the highlighted areas here also have a terminal area chart, and that's a detailed chart that displays Class Bravo and surrounding areas. And finally we have a chart supplement, and that shows the airport information in detail along with some other information that might be useful to you, like runway lengths and traffic patterns and things like that. So let's start with the sectional chart. As a reminder, you can go to skyvector.com and look at the charts. World VFR is a seamless chart that puts all the charts together, but you can select individual charts by moving the crosshair where you want it to be, and then selecting that applicable chart. Now the benefit of doing that is so you can see the legend on the side of the chart. You can also see military, prohibited, restricted, and all those airspaces on the side and their associated times, altitudes, and frequencies. Here is an update schedule for all the charts and the publications. And as you can see, the charts are updated every 6 months and the chart supplements every 56 days. Which means that if anything happens in between that time, there will be a notum for it. So make sure you look at the notums. Now you might be thinking, I have this fancy 4Flight app and it updates everything automatically all by itself. You still need to check the notums. Some of those things might not be on the chart. So let's start with the basics. I've zoomed into the New Orleans chart. The first thing we'll notice is these black lines with dashes going up and down and left and right that make a square. And those are lines of latitude and longitude. As you can see on the left here we have 89. If you go further to the right that's 88. And those are your lines of longitude. You can also see a 32, that's 32 degrees north, 32 degrees latitude. And if we zoom out a little bit you can see that there's a 32 and a 31 further to the south. Now in the middle you have half a degree. Each degree is split up into 60 minutes. So there are 60 tick marks between 31 and 32 and also between 89 and 88. And that means that we can find the latitude and longitude of our airport. So this little airport, this Waynesboro airport, we can find the latitude and longitude for. 31 degrees was on the bottom. Right here is 3130. 31 degrees and 30 minutes. And then if we count up a little bit, it looks like it's just below the 9 mark. So we can say that the latitude is 31 degrees and about 38 minutes. We can do the same thing for longitude. Right in between is 8830. And it looks like this is right at uh, 88 and 38. So the airport location is 31 degrees 38 minutes north and 88 degrees 38 minutes west. If we look at the chart supplement for Waynesboro Municipal, you can see that the latitude and longitude matches what we found. The next thing in our happy little square around Waynesboro is this one and a two. And that's 1,200. This is the minimum safe altitude within that square. So if you fly at 1,200 or above, you won't hit anything. Now as you can see on your chart, you have little M looking stacks and those are obstacles. They're usually towers. And you have a bunch of them. And for each one of those, you have an altitude that you will hit that obstacle at or the top of the obstacle. And then in parentheses, it says how far you will fall down. In other words, the top number is MSL and the bottom is AGL. Now this 1,200 minimum safe altitude is based on the highest obstacle plus about 200 feet or so. So if you look in the northwest corner, there's an obstacle of 1,022 feet. And then they added a couple hundred feet and rounded that to an even number. And that's how you get your minimum safe altitude. So there is a tiny little margin of error. Next are these yellow areas, and those are populated areas. We also have cities, and those are depicted with a circle and a name right next to it. Bigger cities are the yellow. Something else you can see are highways. There's quite a few. There's Highway 84. You can also see roads that go in and out of cities. And you can see rivers and creeks and lakes all labeled, uh, as well as power lines. 
Right next to Wayneboro, you might notice a dashed magenta line, and there's actually a couple of them. They're going north and south, and those are lines of magnetic variation. Believe it or not, but magnetic north and true north are not in the same spot geographically. Actually, magnetic north has been moving over the years, and here's what it looks like. And true north is the axis where the Earth spins. So those are off by about 200 miles or so. And this is why we have magnetic variation lines. So for example, here if you were flying from east to west, 270 would be the west heading, but you would have to add and fly 271 to compensate for that magnetic variation. Let's go to a different part on the chart for some more information. Airports are depicted as circles, unless the runways are longer than 8100 feet, and then the runway is depicted by rectangles. Blue airports are tower controlled, or they have a control tower, and magenta airports don't have a control tower there. If you see a filled circle, that's an airport that has a paved runway, and an unfilled circle is an unpaved airport. Circles with an R in them, that's a private or a restricted airport where you need permission to land there. And if you see tick marks around the airport, like uh, right here at Bay Minette, I guess, uh, that means that there is fuel available where those tick marks are. And then if there's a star right next to the airport, that means they have a rotating beacon at the airport. If you run across a circle with an X through it, that means that the airport is closed and don't land there, obviously. For this next part, I'm going to bring up two airports just so we can see the differences between them. And don't panic, there's a lot of information on the chart. We're only interested in certain specific things. So on the left you see San Jose Airport, and that's depicted by two long rectangles, or two runways. And then on the right is Byron Airport, which is an uncontrolled airport. What we're interested in is this text right here for both of them. The first line is the airport name and then the identifier in parentheses. On the second line for San Jose, it says the control tower frequency is 124.0, and there's also a star next to it, which means that the control tower is part-time. When the control tower is not in operation, this becomes an uncontrolled airport. In that same line, you see the ATIS, or the Automated Terminal Information Service, and that's on 126.95. And then for Byron Airport, they have an AWOS system, and that's on 123.775. The next line starts with the elevation. So for San Jose, the elevation is 62 feet, and for Byron, it's 79. Star L on both of them means that the runway lighting is operational part-time. And this is where you look at your chart supplement to figure out what that lighting situation is. Sometimes it just means that it's pilot controlled and you can turn it on yourself. The next number is the longest runway available. So for San Jose, it's 11,000. You just have to add two zeros to the end. And for Byron, it's 4,500 feet. And then the frequency on both of them is the CTAP frequency, 122.95 for San Jose and 123.05. And for Byron, it's indicated with the C next to it. For San Jose, there is no C because it's a controlled airport, but when it isn't controlled, that's when you use the 122.95. Right below that, it tells you that there is right traffic pattern or right pattern for runway 12 right and 30 right. And for Byron, it says for runway 5 and 30 there is right pattern. If there is nothing indicated, then it's left traffic pattern. Now, since we're looking at San Jose, you see the little compass rose and that indicates that there is a VOR present. And the VOR happens to be on the airport, kind of on the northwest corner where those runways are. And you can see the arrow that goes up to zero, and that's the VOR alignment to true north. Now leading off from the VOR, you'll see blue lines, and those are Victor Airways, like one going to 009, that's the Victor Airway radial, and then there's a couple more going around the circle. If you remember from a previous video, Victor Airways are four miles to each side of the radial, and they go from 1200 feet AGL up to 18,000 MSL. On the Victor Airways, you might see little arrows that intersect, and those are intersections. So if you had a GPS and you typed in, let's say, Meissen or Meissen or whatever, that would take you to that specific intersection. The VOR information is depicted by the rectangle. It says the VOR name, frequency, and the identifier, and the Morse code identification. Around San Jose, you'll see these flags and names that are written and underlined. And those are VFR checkpoints. So if you hear ATC tell you to report over fairgrounds, that's what they're talking about, VFR checkpoints. Now I forgot to mention for Byron Airport, there is a parachute symbol and a glider symbol. 
and that's pretty self-explanatory. There's glider activity and there's skydiving activity. Next to Byron, we also have wind turbines depicted, and there's two areas, the north part, the highest one is 1762, and the southern part, uh, 1980 is the highest. We'll skip to another part of the country, we'll look at Omaha. You see the Omaha VOR with the VOR information, and then right below it, it says Fort Dodge in the little brackets, and that's a flight service station. Now, above the VOR, you see 122.1 with an R next to it. The R means that the flight service station can receive your transmission, but you can't receive theirs, so you have to listen on the VOR. So to clarify, you transmit on 122.1, but you listen on 116.3. And yes, it gets very annoying, because you'll tell them something, and then you'll be listening to beep, 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 yes, go ahead, beep, beep, and it gets very annoying. However, if you look further north, there is also the Omaha Remote Communications Outlet where you can contact Columbus Flight Service Station. That's the name of it. And the frequency is 122.35. And that one is just a frequency. You don't have to listen to the VOR beeps. These are military training routes. IR means it's an IFR training route and a VR means it's a VFR training route. Now let's do a quick little airspace recap. We'll look at the Chicago uh, sectional. Obviously, Chicago is a class Bravo airport, that's all the blue circles. Just south of it is Chicago Midway, and that's a class Charlie airport. You might notice a notation you haven't seen before. And it says that the class Charlie goes from the surface up to T, which is the top of it is where the bottom of class Bravo is in that section. So the top of class Charlie actually varies from 3,600 feet uh, to the south, the 3,000 in the inner ring, and then down to 1900 feet in the inner circle. We also have Class Delta airspace. This is over here at Aurora. Class Delta is a dotted blue line and the top is depicted in little brackets. As a reminder, there's a 30 nautical mile mode C ring around Class Bravo airspace. And then we finally get into this big area that's big and faded magenta and that's Class Golf up to 700 feet and Class Echo above that. Outside of the faded magenta, we have Class Golf that goes from the surface to 1,200 feet, followed by Class Echo above that. Now let's briefly look at a VFR terminal area chart for Chicago. You can see it's a blown up version of the Class Bravo airspace, so you can see things a little bit clearer. You also have arrival and departure routes for jet aircraft, so you can see that. And that's pretty much it as far as differences. There's also a planning chart that you can see, and it's even more decluttered. And this can help you navigate around the Class Bravo airspace. One final look at airspace and then we'll continue on to the chart supplements. Right here we have the Green Bay sectional chart and I want to point out a couple of airspaces. The big square one is the restricted airspace, R4305, and then there's a couple of military operating areas or MOAs. As a reminder, don't go through the restricted when it's active. And the MOA you can go through when it's active, but be on the lookout for military aircraft and I would highly advise getting flight following. Up north we have a prohibited P204 that's over the Boundary Waters Canoe area. Prohibited areas you can't fly through. However, in this case, it's prohibited up to a certain altitude, which is why you need to go to the legend on your sectional chart. So if you look here, P204 and 205, they are up to, but not including 4,000 feet, and they're continuous. In other words, you can fly above 4,000 feet above the prohibited area and you'll be fine. As far as the MOAs, we saw the Snoopy West and the East and uh, the altitude is where they start, so that's the floor and they extend up to 18,000 feet. So one of them goes from 300 feet, the other one goes from 6,000 feet and they're by NOTAM and then they say when they operate and who you contact and on what frequency to see if it's active and maybe to get flight following through that MOA. And then the restricted airspace, 4305, that one's up to 45,000. As with any publication, make sure you look at the legend and the beginning part of the book so you actually know what you're looking at when you read all this information. Now let's look at Waynesboro Airport. We have the airport name, the identifier, the location is two miles south of the city, and then you have the UTC conversion and the latitude longitude like we found. And then it's on the New Orleans sectional chart, the elevation is 169, it has a rotating beacon, and then that's how you find NOTAMs. Runway 2 and 20, 
is a hard surface runway that's 5,000 feet by 75 feet and it's an asphalt runway. The S-15 means that the runway supports single-wheeled landing gear aircraft with maximum weight of 15,000 pounds. There are medium intensity runway lights and both runways have pappies and there's two lights on the left hand side of the uh, runway. Runway 20 is displaced because of a railroad. They do have fuel, 100 low lead, and for the lights you activate them on the CTAP frequency. And since it's medium intensity, the highest they will ever get is 5 clicks. And of course there's communication frequencies and VOR frequencies. Let's look at a little bit more complicated airport. Now I won't bore you with details and go through this information line by line. Feel free to do that on your own time. But this is just to show you, if you're going someplace busy or a bigger airport, make sure you look at all this, make sure you read all the remarks. More importantly, look at all the notams. These are all the notams that I found for JFK Airport. Now if you made it this far in the video, thank you for sticking around. I hope that this helped and you learned something. Until next time, have fun, fly safe, and always keep learning. See you next time.